<clears throat> Before I call this meeting to order, I would like to note that we have interpretation services for this meeting. The interpreter this evening is Mrs. Villagrana. Ms. Grana, would you please raise your hand? And if anyone needs uh, assistance or a listening device, they can go see her. Antes de llamar a la Junta a Orden, me gustaría notar que contamos con servicios de interpretación para esta Junta, la interpret de la señora Grana atrás. I'd like to call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of April 18th, 2023. Madam Clerk, could you please make the announcement about accessing the meeting and call the roll. In order to participate in the council meeting virtually, please register to speak using the link on the agenda under public comment. To raise your hand to speak on a particular agenda item, please use the raise hand button in the Zoom meeting portal. If you are using a phone, please press star nine on your telephone keypad and then press star six to unmute your phone. When it is your time to speak, you will be requested to unmute your microphone and speak for the time allotted by the mayor. Your microphone will be muted upon completion of your comments. I would also like to announce that Councilmember Escobedo has requested to participate via Zoom this evening pursuant to AB 2449, which is the new Brown Act participation rules. Councilmember Escobedo must participate with both audio and visual technology, provide a brief statement for his just cause participation, and announce if there are any persons 18 years or older present in the room with him, if any, and their relation, his relationship to those individuals. Additionally, Councilmember Escobedo may only utilize just cause participation rule not to exceed one more time during the cal calendar year as only two times are allowed. And finally, all votes must be taken by roll call vote. Before I call the roll, Councilmember Escobedo, uh, would you first provide your just cause statement for the need to participate remotely? And second, announce if there is anyone 18 years or, or older with you and their relationship to you. Please un unmute your microphone. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, Mayor, City Council members, and everybody who's watching us. Uh, the reason of why I'm not able to uh, to attend this uh, this <clears throat> this council meeting it's uh, due to the uh, I'm recovering from a uh, flu, so uh, I don't want to put nobody at a risk. Even though that I'm already uh, feeling much better, I prefer not to put uh, nobody in in a situation to get uh, the same. Uh, illness they had. And in regards, uh, there's just uh, here in the room, there's nobody. But uh, and then following in the room next door, there is uh, my mom. That's it. Thank you very much. As a reminder, after the roll call, if you'd uh, please mute your microphone and then raise your hand when you have a comment. And I'll let the mayor know when you um, have done so. And I will call the roll now. Councilmember Aguilera Hernandez. Here. Councilmember Cordero. Here. Councilmember Escobedo. Here. Councilmember Soto. Here. Madam Mayor Patino. Here. Thank you. First item of the agenda this evening is a proclamation, and Councilmember Soto will be making the presentation. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this proclamation is for Library Week. Whereas National Library Week was created in 1958 as a national observance sponsored by the American Library Association and libraries across the country to celebrate the contributions of libraries and librarians. And whereas the theme of National Library Week, there's more to the story, promotes the idea that libraries are places for the community to connect with others, as well as resources to positively impact their lives. And whereas the Santa Maria Public Library is committed to upholding the values of National Library Week and encouraging community members to discover and connect with the library's diverse collection of materials and resources. And whereas the Santa Maria Public Library is celebrating National Library Week by hosting a variety of programming, embracing patron curiosity through the Library of Things collection, market space, Makerspace program and substantial resources on its website. 
and whereas the Santa Maria Public Library strives to meet the needs of the community through enhanced collections, thoughtful programs, and outreach services. And whereas librarians are trained professionals and help people of all ages and backgrounds find and interpret the information they need to live, learn, and work. Now, therefore, the Mayor, Alice Patino of the City of Santa Maria, hereby recognizes April 23rd through April 29th as National Library Week in the City of Santa Maria and encourages all residents to connect with the fellow community members at the Santa Maria Public Library or one of its branch, branch libraries for, a curated, for curated programming, technology, early literacy skills, and continuing education support services. And here to accept the proclamation is our library director, Don Jackson. Good evening, Mayor Patino and City Council members. Thank you for your recognition again this year of National Library Week and the positive impact that libraries have on our community. As mentioned, the theme of this year's National Library Week is there's more to the story, which I consider to be a perfect theme to invite the community to explore the vast and diverse resources that the library has to offer from books to beyond. I, we hear it every day. I didn't know the library had that. so. The Library of Things offers items ranging from technology to music to home arts. Library programs teach new skills, build emerging skills, and offer opportunities to connect with others in the community. We provide access to technology, support, and resources for veterans, travelers, job seekers, entrepreneurs, and students. Bookmobile and outreach services bring library services to folks where they are right now in the community. And this is just a small sample of what the library brings out to the community. So we invite you to come into one of our locations, visit our bookmobile, or log on to our website to discover one or maybe many resources, collections, or materials that are new to you. Thank you again for your recognition and continued support of our library services. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is another proclamation and Council Member Cordero will be making the presentation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a proclamation for the National Day of Prayer. It says, uh, whereas National Day of Prayer is an annual event established by an act of Congress which encourages Americans to pray for the nation, its people, its, and its leaders, and whereas the Day of Prayers prayer have been called for since 1775 when Continental Congress designated a time for prayer in forming a new nation and whereas in 1863 Abraham Lincoln called for such a day and whereas officially day of prayer was established as an annual event by an act of Congress in 1952 and was signed into law by President Truman and whereas the law was amended in 1988 and signed in by President Ronald Reagan, establishing the Day of Prayer as the first Thursday of May each year. And whereas the Day of Prayer affords everyone the ability to exercise their freedom <clears throat> to gather and pray to unify hearts, communities, and the country while holding dear their faith, freedoms, and to one another as fellow Americans. And whereas the city of Santa Maria is celebrating its 26th annual day of prayer and continues to host one of the largest day of prayer gatherings in the state of California. Now, therefore, Alice Patino, mayor for the city of Santa Maria, hereby recognizes the fourth day of May 2023 as National Day of Prayer in the city of Santa Maria and encourages people of all faiths to participate in day of prayer and attend the observance at the Santa Maria Fair Park from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. This was witnessed and signed in by the hand of the mayor and the seal of the great city of Santa Maria was affixed hereto on the 18th day of April, 2023, 
and signed by uh, Alice Patino. And here to receive this is another person. Uh, Veronica Leach. There you go. Mayor Patino, Council City members, thank you very much. It's an honor to receive this. Um, it's very exciting to be here for the 26th year. So thank you for your support year after year. We look forward to move forth. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so the, the next, <clears throat> excuse me, the next item on the agenda is another proclamation. And Mr. Cordero, you're gonna be doing this proclamation also. Yes, and here it is. This is for the Medical Laboratory Proclamation. I just dropped our person here. Whereas in 2023, Lab Week theme, it, it's, it's all right because you save, you're saved by the lab. <laughs> Recognizes uh, the laboratory professional, professionals perform tests that can discover a health issue even before the symptoms occur. And whereas professionals who practice in the medical laboratories are invaluable members of the patient and healthcare team, and whereas these well-educated and highly trained health professionals who perform and evaluate medical laboratory tests to detect, diagnose, monitor, and prevent diseases save countless lives each day. And whereas their dedication to quality medical testing and exceptional patient care are demonstrated daily in numerous laboratories along the Central Coast. And whereas there are 18 chapters statewide of the California Association of Medical Technology and the local chapters support each of the Dignity Health Central Coast hospitals where, whereby many of its professional members live and work in the city of Santa Maria. And whereas the chapter will use this week to educate the public about the key role laboratory professionals play in it and enhance the image of clinical laboratory professionals in the public and private sector. Now therefore, Alice Patino, mayor for the city of Santa Maria, hereby recognizes the week of April 23rd through the 29th 2023 as Medical Laboratory Professional Week in the city of Santa Maria and encourages residents and businesses to recognize the vital contribution of the local chapter of the California Association of Medical Technology. This is witnessed and, and signed by our mayor, Alice Patino, on the 18th day of April, 2023. And here to receive this is Laura. Laura, is Trinu? Trinu. Trinu, okay. Thank you for the recognition. My name's Laura. I'm here on behalf of my mom. She is out of town, so she can't be here today. But um, she is a clinical laboratory scientist, and she has worked at Marion for 25 years. Um, and now she's transitioning up to the lab in Arroyo Grande. She's also the president of CAMELT, um, California Medical Laboratory Technicians. And um, basically, yeah, the lab is a really important part of healthcare in general. Anytime you're getting a COVID swab or sending your urine or drawing the blood, um, it's the lab who's, you know, analyzing everything. And so the whole healthcare system couldn't function if the lab wasn't there. Um, and they always need more people to work in the lab. And um, everyone, there's shortages everywhere. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda this evening is a presentation of the businesses of the month. And uh, I, along with Council Member Aguilera Hernandez, will be making the presentation. And Mr. Morris. 
Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, and those who are, are with us today. Um, it's a pleasure again to be back to uh, highlight a couple of our local businesses. Um, as you know, this year we are focusing on um, health care businesses and businesses that have operated in our city uh, for an extended period of time. Um, interesting, we just had the presentation on the medical labs, and, and it just points out, uh, along with our recognized business in that category, um, the, the diversity, the variety of services that are available in our community um, by um, health care providers um, as large as Marion um, or as small as an individual chiropractic office. So um, today we're going to start with Arnsdorf Chiropractic. Um, Ray, Dr. Ray uh, um, has been a chiropractor for about 20 years in practice here in the community. Um, grew up in the Santa Maria Valley and after training and education returned back here to serve in his own community. Um, he, in addition, he has maintained an advanced proficiency rated status uh, as a chiropractor for 19 years. Um, has worked as an associate clinical instructor teaching others um, the, the techniques for the, at least seven years. Um, and recently, well, it's not recently anymore, several years ago, um, added a certification uh, as a medical examiner for the Federal Motor Carrier uh, Safety Administration, which allows him to provide required medical exams uh, for those who um, are driving trucks um, in the community, which is um, an important part of, of our community for sure. Um, Ray again, continues to be involved in the community. He's been a youth um, athletics coach, um, has done physical exams for athletes from grade school through, through college ranks, um, has been an active member and leader in the Kiwanis Club for um, 19 years, it says, um, and uh, in addition has served on the Chambers Board and in a number of leadership roles uh, in our organization over the last 14 or 15 years. Um, I, 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 we, we asked um, here, you know, how do you, how do you respond to, to, you know, to periods of adversity in your business? And he, this is, I loved what he, what he said. He said, I love what I do. Um, my patients can feel it. I come into the office each day looking to get my patients better so they can lift their kids, go play golf, or provide for their families. So I think that you know, wraps up in a, in, in a good way um, the service that Dr. Ray provides. So, Mayor, members of council, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ray Arnstorff. Thank you, Mayor Patino, council members. Uh, like Glenn said, when I got done with college, the first place I wanted to come back to was my hometown, Santa Maria. Love to be a citizen here. And, uh, technically, I live in Oregon, so maybe you can't call me a citizen, but I like to call myself a business citizen because I come to work here in the city of Santa Maria. That's where my business license is. I get the opportunity to be a true citizen, a serviceable citizen, a citizen who's giving back. I do that both professionally and socially, and uh, I thank you very much for this award. I often find if I have a question about one of our really small businesses in town, I call Ray. He knows them all. Uh, he's really well connected, which is great. Uh, our um, our long-standing business this year or this month um, is Melby Jewelers. Um, the Melby Jewelers is a fourth-generation business um, in in our community, uh, and are just celebrating their 101st year of operation. Um, they were telling me that the, it was originally started in Lompoc, but in the 1930s they realized they were doing business with more people in Santa Maria, and so they followed them here, uh, which was. We think that worked out very well. Um, the, the business now, I think it's the third and fourth generations are working in the business um, here, continuing to provide high quality services 
uh, and products um, to, to those of us in our community. Um, there's a long history within the family of, of community service through uh, membership in Rotary and the Elks. Um, and um, again, this is just a wonderful small business that has continued to operate. Um, I think any, any business that get, you know, in, in our world, they, they say if they can get past the second generation, uh, maybe there's hope, right? And so they made it to the fourth. Um, so we figured they're gonna stick around for a little while. So um, Mayor, members of the council, I'd like to introduce Mark and Alexander Melby. Thank you very much, Mr. Morris. The next item on the agenda this evening is the public comment period. Madam Clerk, could you please read the criteria for the public comment portion of the agenda? This time is reserved to accept comments from the public on consent agenda items, closed session items, or matters not on the printed agenda this evening. If you are participating via Zoom and wish to make a public comment, now is the time to raise your hand in the Zoom meeting portal. Unless otherwise directed by the mayor, speakers will have three minutes to comment. Direction to staff may be given, however, state law does not allow action to be taken on matters not on the printed agenda. Once the public comment period commences, no other speakers will be allowed to submit a request to speak form or request acknowledgement in Zoom. Um, and Madam Mayor, we have one in-person public comment request and I do not see any in Zoom. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Gary Hall. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. You Hall. You added a Mr. on there. That was very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, Staff, and Santa Maria citizens. My name is Gary Hall. I'm a resident of Rancho Buena Vista Mobile Estates at 2135 North Railroad Avenue here in Santa Maria. I represent the North Santa Barbara County Mobile Homeowners Team, or Nesbitt. Tonight is my 50th City Council meeting where I have attended and asked for the City of Santa Maria to join over 100 other California jurisdictions that have provided their mobile home park residents with protection from excessive rent increases and in that way helped maintain affordable housing for their senior and low income citizens. I'm trying very hard to remain optimistic about our chances of success. The June 7, 2022 motion passed by Council Members Soto, Escobedo, and Cordero provided a real boost to our confidence since its passage, the mobile home resident representatives have participated in three stakeholder meetings that have produced a sense of progress. It's now been nearly two months since our last stakeholder meeting and we are anxious to get the next meeting scheduled. We believe the issues and proposed solutions which we identified and delivered in our January 9th email provides a list of the necessary enhancements that should be made to the existing model lease. Those issues and solutions include one, park owner participation and overall effectiveness of the program, two, necessary outreach to all mobile home residents, three, the lack of enforcement, and four, the economic terms. We are of course also ready to look at alternatives, which was provided for in the June 7th motion. Our overall goal remains to provide protection to all Santa Maria mobile home residents presently living in an unregulated rental market where the current model lease program has been ineffective in protecting homeowner equity and maintaining affordable mobile home housing. We continue to believe that goal is achievable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Uh, before we move on, <clears throat> Mr. Silwell, did you have any comments? Okay, moving on to the next item is a presentation. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? 
The City Council will receive an update on Hope Village, a temporary interim supportive housing community specifically for people experiencing homelessness in the Santa Maria Valley to be located on county-owned property at 2131 Southside Parkway. Okay, and Mr. Wu, would you like to make the introductions for us? Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, we have a presentation of, on Hope Village, and we have representatives from Dignity Moves and also from uh, Terry Nussich, is from, I think recently retired from the county, is also here and also represented from uh, various partners. Uh, but uh, Dignity Moves will provide the uh, presentation. Thank you. Good uh, evening. Th thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council and staff. Uh, my name is Matt Riley. I am the Regional Executive Director for mm -hmm. Dignity Moves. It's my pleasure to provide this update for the, uh, for the Hope Village project uh, located just down the road. We do have representatives here tonight from the county, uh, from our project management team, from our key services partners of Good Samaritan Fighting Back Santa Maria Valley and our uh, partners at, at Dignity Health, not related. Um, and so during Q&A, um, there's lots of folks here that can answer questions. So um, I'm gonna go through a little bit of background first and then we'll get into the, some of the project specifics. Let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, yep. Okay, so let's just start with uh, the community action plan that the, 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 uh, the county uh, drafted in partnership with um, other uh, city jurisdictions. Um, and we want to say thank you to the city of Santa Maria for adopting that community action plan on May 4th of 2021. As part of that plan, there were a number of strategies that were outlined related to increasing access to uh, affordable housing, to um, uh, use best practices to deliver uh, tailored supportive services, uh, build uh, a better uh, data, uh, uh, data, data sharing, get gathering and sharing platform um, to uh, uh, strengthen support systems uh, and help obtain and maintain our housing, which is a, which is a, a, a critical need in our county. Um, and also uh, build, pro uh, uh, provide capacity to address uh, the needs of specific populations. Dignity Moves is a 501c3 nonprofit, and really the only thing we do, we're based in California, the only thing we do is we try to get interim supported, interim supportive housing built. We focus only on this uh, interim supportive housing element, temporary housing like we're talking about with Hope Village. Um, the need in the community action plan as outlined uh, uh, was approximately 563 uh, beds that the, that the county would need, broken up, kind of hard to see on the screen, but some of you have the presentation in front of you, uh, 369 in South County, 61 in Mid County, and 133 in North County. Of the 563, 140 uh, have already been built, including one project that we worked on in, in uh, uh, the city of Santa Barbara in downtown. Um, in addition, there's uh, several other projects that have come online since the community action plan. Uh, which leaves uh, 423 beds uh, needed. And in the pipeline, there's a, roughly 123 beds in a couple of different projects that we'll talk about in, in later slides. And that creates a shortfall of approximately 300 beds. And this is what we've been trying to tackle in partnership with the county and others, trying to figure out you know, where can we put these beds, what's the right place to put them, and um, trying also to get them um, uh, in place uh, in short order because we have a crisis right now. The, um, this is the uh, uh, point in time count that was done earlier this year. It's done annually on one day. And we wanted to put these numbers up there. Uh, the 2023 numbers are, are rather fresh just to show some of the trends that we're seeing in, in some of the regions within the county. We're seeing a modest uh, decrease uh, in, in Santa Barbara, um, and we're seeing um, uh, an increase of a, of a little over a dozen individuals from 2022 to 2023 in Santa Maria. And so I just wanted to put this up there just to show that this is kind of the trend that we're seeing in, in some of these areas. For Santa Maria specifically, these are the locations of where these individuals um, 
uh, were located during the point in time. So remember, this is one day, and an army of volunteers uh, led by many in, in the community. Um, and you can see that there are a lot of individuals in and around the city. I don't think that's uh, news to, to most folks here. Um, I think we all uh, can see the need uh, as, as, we, uh, as we drive and look around the city. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the projects going on. Uh, we're going to get into details on Hope Village, but I also wanted to mention that uh, Dignity Moves in partnership with the county and, and other uh, services organizations, we're, looking, we're working on a project called La Posada, which is in the unincorporated area between Goleta and Santa Barbara uh, on Hollister Avenue. Uh, there's a, there are a couple of other projects in the works at uh, Bridge House down in Lomp outside of Lompoc on Sweeney Road. Uh, looking at expanding the facility, the Good Samaritan runs very successfully there. Uh, we're looking at uh, the Calle Real County Campus property to look at some of the parking lots to see if there's something that we could do there. Um, and also, uh, St. Vincent's uh, bought a piece of land um, also, uh, I think it's in the city, uh, maybe right outside the city boundary um, in Santa Barbara, again, between uh, Santa Barbara and Goleta right where State Street turns into Hollister. And so they're looking at doing a project there. Um, so they're working on the design of that project. So there are numerous things going on throughout the county, including and especially uh, the Hope Village project. So what, we, what we've uh, put together on this project is a really interesting partnership uh, between uh, public and private in, uh, organizations and philanthropy. And I'll get into that a little bit more detail. But some organizations that I want to point out, uh, Good Samaritan is going to be the lead service agency. And we're just blessed, frankly, to have them in our backyard. They're the best. You know, we work throughout California. We continually point at Good Samaritan as the gold standard by which every other services partner in all the other projects that we work on uh, look at Good Samaritan and the way they do their work and try to emulate a lot of those best practices. Fighting Back Santa Maria Valley uh, focuses on transitional age youth, and Edwin's here and will speak uh, in a couple minutes about uh, some of that work. And then we also have a really unique partnership with uh, the Dignity Health Organization around respite care. And that's, I say that's unique because it's something we're doing at Hope Village that we, we think is a blueprint for other projects throughout the state and the nation can look and see how these projects can partner with local uh, hospital uh, organizations to figure out, you know, how can we address that need related to emergency room use and respite care and housing. So some basics on um, the project. Um, we we started looking at this project last year. We, we actually, far long before that, we looked at lots of different locations for this particular project and settled on the location that I have some maps on, on exactly the property that we're, we're working on. Uh, it's been many months to design this project. I think I've already mentioned a couple of times there's some unique features of this with respite care, with the hospital, with transitional age youth. These are things that uh, we really wanted to build into this project because of the, the population we're serving. So the total uh, number of beds is 94, 94 units. And um, of those 94, 10 are for transitional age youth. That's eight, ages 18 to 24, generally coming out of the foster care system. Um, and 30 will be specifically for the respite care, like I was talking about with, in partnership with Dignity Health. 10 of those actually have ensuite bathrooms. So then the balance have congregate bathrooms and showers and laundry. And those 10 specific units are really for folks that need intense medical care coming out of the hospital. And I think, again, that's kind of a unique feature of this project that does not exist in our downtown Santa Barbara project, nor is it even being planned for on the La Posada project, but we want to probably replicate that on other projects uh, throughout the state and throughout the, the county here. The duration of the project, which is really important, uh, is five years, and after five years, we're building this with construction elements that uh, the housing can just be lifted up with forklifts, and so after five years, in fact, probably fairly soon, we're gonna start looking at 
locations of where we're going to move these units in five years um, so that, um, you know, the idea here being that this is temporary. Uh, this is the location that's been selected for the first five years and we need to start already looking at where we're going to be moving these units moving forward, uh, presuming that it's going to be as successful as our South County project and also really the other Dignity Moves projects that we've been done throughout the state. I think I also want to note here before I hand it off to Edwin that uh, this project is really for the, uh, the folks experiencing homelessness around the Santa Maria area. There's a prioritization around that um, that's been uh, at the forefront of, of, of every conversation that we've had. And I show you the point in time map because I think that's really, uh, we want to highlight that that's, that's really, really important. We did that down in South County in the uh, Santa Barbara, downtown Santa Barbara project. Basically drew a map with a big square that said this is where we're prioritizing and until we've gotten our arms around the, the issue here, uh, we're going to be focusing just on people within this within this region, and I think that's really important for these projects to have that geographical focus. So, I'm going to hand it over to Edwin for a minute here, just to talk about some of the services Dignity Moves builds these things, gets them up and and functioning, and then the actual hard work happens when the services organizations come in and and do the day-to-day -day, um, case management and um, really um, helping individuals, so. Hello, City Council, Madam Mayor and public. Um, Sylvia uh, Bernard couldn't be here today. She's out of town, so um, Kirsten Calhoun is on the Zoom in case there's any service questions. I don't know if there's ability to, to let her speak or not, but, um, you know, the reason I got excited about this program is uh, I care a lot about young people. And uh, I got a call from my friend over at CASA, Kim uh, Colby Davis, who runs CASA. And she said, hey, I have a, I have a young person who's aged out um, and he's at a, a, a hair salon because <laughs> he's friends with the owner's daughter and he needs help. So I drove over there and um, sure enough, he's 21. Um, so he's no longer eligible for uh, child welfare services and he's on the streets. He's been living on the streets for the last two years. And he was really suffering from some mental health issues and he didn't have a place to stay and he was afraid to sleep on the street again and so he asked for help. Uh, there were no beds in Santa Maria available. Um, there's nothing, at the, the shelter was full um, and, and so I was able to ask um, Good Sam at, uh, in Lompoc to assist and they were able to put him in congregate care. So that means he's in a room with you know, 40 or 50 other people. He sleeps there that night, wakes up in the morning at 8.30, then he has to make, find something to do all day, and then he can come back at 4.30 and hopefully that bed will be there for him if it's not too crowded. And so we were able to uh, negotiate with mental health and get him some services. We were able to uh, actually get him enrolled at Hancock, but the, the congregate setting wasn't good for his mental health and so he left. I don't know where he is. Um, I try to text him like once a month to see how he's doing. He hasn't been talking to me. Um, and I think something like Hope Village could have helped him. Because the difference between Hope Village and, and the traditional shelter is he would have had his own room. He would have walked in, he would have pushed the key code, gone into his own room, been able to sleep, keep his things there. He has storage. If he has a pet, he can keep his pet with him. If he has a partner, they could stay there together. And he has six months to a year to stabilize, get on-site mental health treatment, on-site substance abuse treatment, on-site medical care, all to provide for his needs so he can stabilize and then move on to some sort of permanent housing. Uh, there's nothing like that in North County. We, we really um, are at a have a great opportunity here to provide our citizens something uh, that they need. Those citizens that we care about, that we see in the tents, we see in the encampments, we see in the riverbed, we see around our town. And you know, the thing that I find when I do the point in time count is these are our children just, they grew up. <laughs> you know, the last person I did a point in time count, he, he went to Rigetti High School 30 years ago. 
He's been living on the streets for 25 years. Um, they're not from some other place. They're from here. They're from our community. They're our kids. They're our uncles. They're our, so, as Sylvia says, they're always somebody, somebody. And so I'm really excited about this opportunity. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't, Millie, you want me to talk about, that's okay. So the, the, the great thing about this as well is, um, you know, we're going to be able to clear out our, our hospital emergency room. A lot of our beds are being taken up with people who um, need to be discharged, but there's no home for them to go to, and so they can't go anywhere. And right now, there's eight beds at the shelter for those folks, and they need more um, to clear out hospital rooms for all of us so that we go in, the ER can be available to us who, who need help right then. And so Good Sam will pro be providing the services for those medically fragile folks uh, as the hospital discharges them in partnership with them. And so it really does meet two big needs. is our youth who are homeless, 18 to 24 year olds. They'll have 10 beds and there'll be 30 beds for our medically fragile folks coming out of the hospital. And then the rest will be for our rest of the community. And so I'm really excited about it. Um, there's gonna be a lot of rules. There's gonna be security. There's gonna be full-time staff. We're gonna have a full-time staff person there uh, for, uh, for the 18 and 24 year olds. Um, and so uh, we've worked very hard to talk to the community. We've had community meetings. We've gone to every pl uh, public place we can go to to talk <laughs> and, and talk about this project and then hear about concerns and then try to address those concerns. So thank you for your time. And I'm gonna hand it back to Matt to, to finish up. So here's the location of the property, um, just located off of Southside Parkway. There's actually two parcels, um, and most of these maps they show as vacant, but there is a uh, kind of a temporary gravel parking lot that was built, I think, back when they were doing the solar for the, for the county that, that's existing there. Sometimes there's cars there, so that's kind of on the parcel to the right. Um, there's a better view. Now we're looking north-south. And uh, the entire project is going to be on the parcel to the south. So the more square looking one, not the rectangle. Um, and that parking lot is just to the north. This is a site plan that if you're trying to look at it on the screen in here, there's no way you can see what's going on there. But um, I have some uh, poster boards, maybe Derek, maybe we could put them like along the railing there and we can point to them. Um, but basically what this is showing is all the white squares are single individual uh, units, eight, eight feet by eight feet, and the blue is, is that okay to put this? Okay, the, the blue, uh, that, those are our, our restroom and laundry facilities, and the orange, that's office, dining, clinics, um, any kind of use, use that the service providers might need, and in this case we definitely have some health uh, clinics uh, space that we that we definitely need. This is my favorite image and it's one of those, a 3D rendering of Hope Village, which kind of gives you a better feel for, for what I'm talking about. Um, it's uh, quite a few units. It's, um, it has uh, other features uh, associated with it that actually um, we're very, very proud of. I mean, you know, we have things like open space, we have foliage, we have seating areas that are outside. Uh, we have a beautiful entrance. We have uh, a, fa you know, a facade that looks nice. We, have, we will probably have artwork on the outside commissioned by some local artists. Um, the reason why we do some of these things is kind of core to what Dignity Moves does is that uh, the majority of this project is going to be funded through philanthropy for, to build it. Now the services side of it is, is funded through uh, various different means with which Terry can get into because it's, you, know, you weave those funding sources together, uh, state and federal funding uh, through the county. Uh, but the capital to provide it is provided by uh, a number of different uh, places, but uh, in large part is philanthropy. And the reason why we do this is that we can make it a little bit more beautiful with not a lot of money. And that's hard to do with when things are funded 100% by government. Um, so if you if you ever if anyone wants to go to the downtown site, we're happy to give you know we give brief tours. You know, folks are there, so we kind of are very um, 
understanding that we don't want to stay too long, but I'm more always happy to pe bring people through because one of the first things that happens is they say, this place is beautiful. And the reason why we do that is that when someone's coming off the street, they, they actually have to trust that where they're going is the right place for them. And when they walk through the door, we want them to feel like somebody's betting on them. Somebody's betting on them to make that next step to a safe housing solution. And when they walk through, they know that their community is, is, has their back. And that was our thesis. And through the downtown site and, all, and others throughout California, that's proven out to be absolutely the case. Uh, person after person that goes through there says, I walked in and it was, it was like a breath of fresh air. I, I, I knew I needed to be there. And I felt like people were seeing me and were, were there to help me out. Um, and that's just a big component of it. So um, we can put this one back up if folks have specific questions about the site. But I wanted to point out there is like a little dog run and some other things inside of the, of the, of the property that, um, that allow for uses that you know, folks will have. We have, uh, we are lucky enough to use a, like a world-renowned architect called Gensler. Uh, they do this for us. They call it low bono, but really, if they really, if you really look at it, it's no, it's it's pro bono. I mean, it's a s small charge, probably for paper that they print off of, um, and they have a whole team that help us with all these projects. So we're very, very fortunate that that design that you see is really the result of a huge design team that is here to really help the, help our community out. Um, I mentioned uh, partnerships with the county, Dignity Health, um, and also with the, with the city, which we very much appreciate. Um, mentioned at the bottom, the total cost is roughly six and a half million dollars, which I said uh, earlier is uh, majority is uh, philanthropic, uh, high net worth individuals, or maybe not high net worth individuals, just any individuals, and a lot of foundations have participated in this. Um, and I have to tell you, because part of my job is to get that money. It has been amazing, the response that Santa Barbara County, and even folks outside of Santa Barbara County, but pr primarily folks within the county, um, have seen this and how it resonates with them, that this is a solution. And I think uh, for a lot of folks that's uh, been waiting for a solution like this to come along, and something that we can do, that we can do at scale to hopefully address the problem or the issue. I'm throwing up a few images here. Um, I'll just point out uh, the upper right is the entrance to the Santa Barbara site. We'll you know, we're trying to be, make something look beautiful like that. If you drove by it, that Dignity Move sign isn't there. If you drove by it right now, you probably would have no idea it's there. It really fits in with the, with the neighborhood. And then the lower right is a view of, I think, about roughly eight units. Um, a little step to get in. These are not our ADA uh, or accessible units. Uh, we do have those, but this isn't an image of those. Um, and each one of those has a door and a window. Um, the door locks, and that's a really important feature for the residents. Some renderings of Hope Village. On the top, this is kind of what we hope the outside to, uh, will look like. Um, uh, the entrance to the, to the project, and then the bottom, this is a view of the inside, kind of in that central area where there'll be some communal seating and some of the units in the background um, tend to have like strong electrical or strong string lighting that you know you and I might put in our backyard. We kind of have that we'll have that throughout the site for modest uh, evening lighting. Um, and then you can see in this image, there's some ramping off to the right-hand side. So every, every bit of the project that is kind of common space, like dining, bathrooms, clinics, and of course, all of the accessible units themselves are all accessible um, uh, uh, for, for individuals who, who might need that. So I'll finish up with the last couple of slides here. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we have done a lot of community engagement for this project, uh, meeting with representatives from the city of Santa Maria, with uh, uh, members of the residential communities, uh, particularly around the project, local businesses reached out 
uh, to the businesses in the area. Of course, um, there's the uh, private businesses uh, to the east of the project, but also the county has a lot of offices uh, to the west and to the north of the project, so we've engaged with those communities as well. Um, uh, local architects, um, and then we're starting to reach out to local resources for uh, art opportunities on the fencing or the front facade um, and, and, and other things like that. And then lastly, just a general mention of just, the, just what we're doing countywide. And I say we, this is not just Dignity Moves, this is really the county and other partners. You know, we're really trying to increase that access to housing, have the accountability of, you know, clearly providing, you know, guidance along responsibility, you know, and dignity moves. You know, we're here passionately trying to just get these, uh, get these projects going, but there are a lot of others in the community that, um, that frankly are, are raising their hand to take responsibility for uh, helping facilitate these projects. Um, outreach, transparency, we hold a lot of meetings like this. Um, mitigation and, and economic opportunities, you know, we want to create employment opportunities if we can. And I think um, uh, Kirsten could probably, if, or, or Hector maybe, um, can talk a little bit about, you know, we have had a lot of people at our downtown site um, uh, gain employment just for the pure fact that they can um, rest, they can they can stabilize, they can take a shower, and they can do laundry. And they can get document ready for, for, a, for a job. And so we've just seen you know, a lot of opportunities that have come folks' way where they're, where they're able to, to get employment, which is key. So with that, I will uh, offer, please, uh, any and all questions. We'd be happy to field. Yeah, any questions from here? Yeah, um, I do. Oh, Mr. Cordero. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You know, I, I, I have to say that this sounds very, very impressive and uh, something that we, we can all participate in to, uh, to help the, the underserved people that are going to be <coughs> utilizing this facility. But are, are there any common things that, that we could learn from you and what you've done in Santa Barbara uh, that, that we can do, we can help ourselves to prevent things from happening that shouldn't happen? or things that we can help to provide or, or supervise to provide uh, to prevent things from happening. You know, I, I just, there's got to be some issues that, that you could say, well, these usually happen or that usually happens. And there's probably a way to mitigate some of these things if we know ahead of time, you know, uh, because I, I'm, I'm excited about this. I think that it, it, uh, it has some great potential. It's a great question. I, I would say that our experience, so we opened the Santa Barbara site in um, August, September, because we kind of a slowly st staged people in, right? Comfortable with the space. So we'll call it September of last year. Um, and what I would say is that what we saw in the neighborhood was almost an immediate positive impact on the number of folks out on the street in the surrounding blocks around the project. And this, this may not be addressing your question specifically, but it kind of it gets to some of the, the, the questions that we tend to, to, to get around um, what's this going to look like uh, at, the, at the project. And I think what we found in Santa Barbara was, and I think we will find here as well, there are lots of folks living on the street, especially in the immediate vicinity of the project. And what we see almost immediately is a lot of those folks move into into the project. And in fact, we've had business owners write us letters, unsolicited letters saying, hey, this is amazing. Um, have had, uh, law enforcement has had a, a, a massive drop in the number of incidents that they're responding to in the area. And particularly, that project is one block from State Street. And for those folks, you know, walk up and down State Street, you know, it can be a real issue of, of folks of, uh, experiencing homelessness kind of setting up camp on State Street the areas around the project have really seen a massive decrease in that. So, and in fact, I think there's a letter uh, from the city that uh, we just recently received that, that states this has been amazing, that all those things kind of are the things they're seeing. And including we have a letter from one of the local business owners that just wanted to say, hey, look, you know, if you're talking to anyone about future projects and, you know, we want, we want them to know, 
again, had I not known about this project, I'd driven by it probably 200 times, and there's never been an incident that he's ever seen of anyone outside of it. So are there things that we can do better? I'm sure there's a whole long list, but I will say, I, I want to reinforce this very clearly. We are so lucky that Good Samaritan is in Santa Maria, is in Santa Barbara County, frankly. So lucky. Because the way they do it, their program is so good. They have, a, they have many tiers of things that they do with individuals and populations in, in all of the beds that they manage, like 500 beds or something like that at this point. Yes. Yeah. And I will tell you that some of them are obvious that you walk in and you see you know, how they're positioning people and staff and what they're doing and the stuff. But so much of it is subtle about how you take, each individual has a story, each individual has a reason why they're there. And somehow Good Samaritan has all these individual reasons and all these individual stories and somehow with their program are seeing successes with all those vari variation of, of, of reasons and I think um, if you asked me how could I prevent some issues that, that might come up on projects statewide, I would tell you we would just copy Good Samaritan's plan. That's my answer. There's like a, there's a hundred things that they're doing that other services agencies could, could, should, could and should do. Related to site security, related to policies around, you know, no friends inside. Um, related to curfew, related to one of the things that they require is that you work on your plan to, to move to the next phase. You know, that's, a, that's subtle, but that is really, really important. So um, I don't have a, a great answer specifically here, but we're always having dialogue around, well, should we add cameras over here, or should we do this or do that? Um, I gotta tell you, it's, um, it's working so well right now that um, I think we just put a plan in for adaptive management, and if issues arise, we can quickly adjust and, 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 um, and address them. Well, sir, I may be a better answer than the one I was asking for, and I, I will share with you that uh, when this first came to light for us here in Santa Maria, one of the things that many of us talked about was Sylvia, and the way she handles things and, 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 uh, and her, her personal business plan to uh, striving for success for these people. Uh, and, and that's where I think it, it lies, uh, the success lies within her business plan and her management uh, of, of this particular problem. So we're glad you have her also. It's a balance between compassion, but also, you know, Sylvia is no pushover. Whatever so, she does, so, you know, she does it's, it, it, well. it's this balance of let's we're moving in this direction, but we're going to do it compassionately, yes. and I think that that is invaluable in, in this space. I would agree with you. Thank you very much. I would Thank like you. to take this opportunity to welcome Mr. Lavanino is here tonight. Mr. Nelson is here tonight. Thank you very much for showing up, um, Mr. Weaver. I. Think, I think a component that is missing that, that probably you haven't shared are the resources that are gonna be there for the people and the expectations of the, the tenants that are gonna be there also. Yeah, so it's, it's not gonna be a drop-in shelter, first of all, I think that's really important. You're, there's not gonna be a line <laughs> in front of the uh, process and people can just get in. They're gonna be referred by people who are already out doing street outreach. I have three full-time staff. Sylvia and her team has a huge outreach staff sitting that does and they, they have relationships with people who live on the streets right now. And so once we um, got a, get a timeline of when we're gonna open, then we'll start evaluating who's ready for this type of setting. Because it's not gonna be exactly for everybody, but it will be for a lot of folks. Um, because there will be rules, there'll be a curfew, there'll be uh, uh, expectations on how we behave as we live there and how we interact with other people, um, including you know striving for sobriety, uh, no drugs and alcohol on the campus, the, no, one, no guests on the campus, so it'll be secure. Only the residents who live there will be there. And then, of course, um, as Matt just said, they'll have a case manager. That person will be making sure that the person who lives there, the resident who lives there, will be moving forward in a plan to exit out of Hope Village into something more permanent. Um, 
And so the services that you asked for, behavioral wellness is already committed to, to providing mental health services, which includes substance abuse treatment, um, which includes evaluation. We could also have access to our local sobering center, which we're very happy to have, as well as uh, detox as well. So they'll be able to go in and, and, and do that first and then live at, at, the, at the village and work their plan. Um, they'll, they'll have food, they'll have three meals a day that will be provided for them, as well as um, they'll have medical care, there will be a medical unit there, and of course um, the case manager fighting back will have one person there full time for the 10, 18 to 24 year olds, and then uh, Sylvia will have the rest of the case managers there to work with the, the folks. Um, and, and it's pretty exciting that we had a chance to go to the pastors network and, and they want to come in and, and send some folks to volunteer, which of course we're open to for mentoring, for book studies or activities, those types of things. And you know, every, when I say case manager, that means if they're employable, let's get them a job so that they can get working and pay for their next rent. If they're not, let's get, make sure that they have their income lined up and if they're eligible for benefits. So the, it really is a, a case manager job is to connect them to all the services in the community that exist. Did I answer your question? What it was? Well, wasn't a question. I was asking you to, to um, elaborate. And what about there will be a manager yes. there full time? Full time. Security there full time? S security full time, okay. yeah. They're, they're on the property. So, And, you know, most problems in a setting like this is are mitigated through the relationship, right? And so they know that if they... Um, step out of line too far, they're going to be asked to leave, and then someone else will be allowed to stay there. Um, and so that's really important. Most folks in the Santa Barbara, uh, you know, village there uh, project, they they value being there so much that they don't mess around and and they really work hard at staying, following their case plan. And an an individual can be there for how long? Six months to a year. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions from the dais? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Oh, one minute. Oh. Uh, I will okay? give. Uh, I'll give you even three minutes. Steve. I'll, I'll take, <laughs> I'm going to take less than that. So you asked what what can be done. So when we went out and we talked to the community, the biggest concern they have is um, security. We've got 24/7 security. I know. The uh, commercial properties behind us are also going to increase their security. But what the neighbors have asked for is, um, and it's outside of our jurisdiction, otherwise I would commit to doing it with the Sheriff's Department, but they would like to see additional patrol if it was from a ranger or whatever just in that area at the beginning just to kind of give them a feel. I mean, we're going to have 24-7 security. We're also going to have cameras. But if there was that increased patrol just in those little neighborhoods right there at the beginning to kind of give them a sense that... You know, that's what they've asked for. And that's the only thing that we've heard back from the community that we aren't able to provide outside of security on site, which is our property. So this okay. is something extra. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And um, uh, Mr. Escobedo had his hand up. So I keep forgetting he's up there in the corner. <laughs> so. Council Member Escobedo. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I, I'm sorry I forget about you. Anyway, go ahead. No, <laughs> no worries. So. Uh, First of all, uh, I want to uh, want to say thank you to the uh, to the team of the whole village because uh, they they reached out to me and we had a really interesting conversation. This is uh, I've been volunteering for uh, reaching outreach to do outreach the homeless community for years and from long time long time ago. One of the biggest uh, challenges it was to have a uh, twelve help people to have access to their resources. Sometimes resources are up there, but they're so scattered. It's, a, it's hard to, it's hard for, uh, for organizations to, to be up there. So I see this project as a hope. That's the, the name of it. It's, it's a, uh, and I've talked with a lot of my constituents and they, they've been, uh, they like the idea, and good point that uh, Supervisor Lamandino mentioned. And uh, one of the top the things that we talked was uh, the safety. So definitely, it would be I think it would be appropriate to uh, to partner and work together on having uh, some sort of uh, patrolling with a ranger or 
trying to figure out something that uh, that can be done so the businesses feel more safe. And I mean, it, it looks great a project. And so I'm looking forward to, to, to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any requests to speak or written correspondence? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, we do not need of neither. Thank you. Anyone, any comments, questions? I'll make um, a comment. Yes, sir. Um, I want to echo Councilmember Escobedo's um, sentiments. Um, much appreciation for the work that you all are doing on this project. Um, it is very impressive to see what you all have been able to do in Santa Barbara. Um, and I applaud y'all's um, political will to, to move forward with this project. So thank you. And thank you to all of the partners who are making this possible. Dignity Health, I mean, yeah, Dignity Health, Good Sam, um, Fighting Back, and all of the entire philanthropic sector as well. So thank you so much. That's it, okay. I wanna thank you very much for finally, we finally got to the city council and thank you very much for the presentation. You're welcome. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. And you can stay for the rest of the meeting if you'd like. <laughs> or not. <laughs> oh, yes. Ms. Jessica yeah, so, Ben? Sorry, I missed to, uh, uh, to, uh, to share that I also um, had a conversation with uh, Supervisor Lavandino and Super Bo Supervisor Bob Nelson. So just want to uh, share that and, yeah, and thank you. appreciate that. Okay, this is informational only, so we'll not be taking a vote. Thank you. The, I'll, let's see, I'll wait till everyone leaves, I guess. Hmm? We need a minute break. The next item is a presentation. Madam Clerk, could you please read the description? The City Council will receive a presentation from Central Coast Community Energy to provide its annual member agency update. And Mr. Stilwell, would you like to do introductions? Sure, just a brief introduction. So Judy Young here is, uh, is here tonight from Central Coast Community Energy. She's the Senior Customer Accounts Manager. Uh, she's here to present the annual update on services. Central Coast Community Energy is the primary electricity provider for Santa Maria and 33 other communities. And um, just a quick tidbit, Santa Maria is the highest, has the highest customer enrollment rate of the 34 cities and counties. And Central Coast Community Energy serves 95% of the population electricity in the five counties. Also of note, um, Santa Maria is a remote public meeting location for cent uh, Central Coast Community Energy meetings. Uh, the mayor is on the policy board with um, Councilmember Cordero as the alternate. There's also an operations board and a community advisory council. So the public's welcome to attend those meetings and attend them in this location, usually in this room. And so Judy Young is here to provide an update and answer any questions. Good evening, Ms. Young. Thank you, uh, Mayor Patino and council members and um, uh, Mr. Stilwell. It is my honor to be here tonight to highlight Central Coast Community Energy's recent accomplishments, as well as our plans for 2023 and beyond. My name is Judy Young. As Mr. Stillwell mentioned, I'm the Senior Customer Accounts Manager with 3CE, with a focus on our member agencies. I will start with a brief introduction to community choice aggregation for anyone who is new to how the CCA model works and how it differs from the investor-owned utility model. Then I will highlight Central Coast Community Energy's history and role in your community. So once a community signs on to a CCA, the CCA takes over electricity procurement while the existing investor-owned utility continues to handle transmission, distribution, metering, and billing. CCAs are public agencies and return revenue to their communities in the form of programs, incentives, and rebates, and can also assist with local job creation and renewable energy development. Our agency has seen tremendous expansion since we formed in 2017. We expanded from Monterey Bay to the entire Central Coast, and your community joined in 2021. 
Today, 3CE is made up of 34 member agencies throughout the five counties, serving nearly 450,000 customers and securing over $1 billion in renewable energy and storage agreements while returning $26 million to our communities. Over 94% of utility customers in our communities are enrolled with 3CE, and in the year 2022 alone, we delivered over 5,000 gigawatt hours of electricity throughout our region. Also in the last year and a half, we enrolled the community of Buellton, completed enrollment of unincorporated regions of Santa Barbara County, and welcomed the city of Atascadero as our newest community. You may have also heard that the county of San Luis Obispo just voted to join the CCA. So that will happen if it goes forward as planned in 2025. It takes a little while. There's a lot of news to report, and I would like to focus on the four major benefits we promised to our communities when we formed in 2017. So let's start with local control. Community choice aggregation allows local government to have greater control over the type and cost of energy supplied to their communities to ensure energy sources and rates reflect the community's values and goals. With 3CE, decisions about where your power comes from and how you are charged for it are made by local elected officials. We are making progress on climate goals together as a region, and we are far ahead of both state and federal targets to decarbonize our energy supply. Here in Santa Maria, you are represented by, represented by Mayor Patino and City Manager Jason Stilwell on our boards, and Mr. Stilwell also serves on the Energy Risk Management Committee. The next commitment is rates, so let's talk about rates, competitive rates. In March of 2022, we decoupled our rates from PG&E's and established our own rate setting procedures based on cost of service, resulting in an average of about 18% savings for residential customers. Small and medium commercial customers saved between 2 and 19% during the year 2022 once we switched to cost of service, and we expect our competitiveness with the incumbent utility to continue. As you can see, we have worked to keep our service affordable for our communities. Now I will shift focus to our efforts to procure clean power. Today we are at 50% clean and renewable power and on track to be at 60% by the year 2025, which is five years earlier than the goal set by the state of California. Our strategy commits 3CE to meet 100% of its demand with clean and renewable resources, by the year 2030 with balancing on a monthly basis, which is a full 15 years ahead of the goal set by the state of California. 3CE is also pursuing offshore wind generation and emerging technology in California. The auction for leases in federal waters off the Central Coast in December of 2022 was an important step in bringing these resources online. In order to achieve these goals, 3CE's procurement team has prioritized long-term contracts that bring new, clean re resources online as quickly as possible. To date, 3CE has executed 19 long-term power purchase agreements and energy storage agreements. Five of these projects came online in 2022 and add up to nearly 275 megawatts uh, uh, megawatt hours of generation and energy storage combined or about 22 percent of our current annual load meeting greenhouse gas reduction goals is also about electrification as individuals the biggest impact we can make to cut greenhouse gas emissions and improve air quality is to replace fossil fuel vehicles and evs with evs and replace the gas appliances in our homes mm -hmm. I was going to ask um, Dignity Moves if they were going all electric and with their, with their HOPE project. Um, as 3CE works to clean the grid, electric cars and appliances will be emissions free in their operation and the electricity that powers them will be 100% clean and renewable. The final 3CE commitment I am reporting on tonight is a continued investment in your community and all of the communities in our service area. 
Here is what we accomplished over the last year. And looking more broadly over the past three years, 3CE has helped put more than 1,000 new and used electric vehicles on Central Coast roads by distributing more than $2 million in cash rebates paid directly to our customers. By electrifying our transportation sector, these EVs have spared more than 6,000 metric tons of regional CO2 emissions. Additionally, in collaboration with funding partners like the California Energy Commission, 3CE has delivered rebates that will help build more than 1,000 new electric vehicle charging stations in the region. We've also paid to make more than 2,000 new affordable housing units all electric, and that support continues. Residential customers within the city of Santa Maria are eligible for rebates up to $5,000 towards EVs and chargers and toward replacing certain gas-powered appliances. And we also have programs aimed at helping our member, member agency partners advance electrification and stay up to date with building codes that advance electrification. And we have business-friendly programs designed to electrify new housing, including farm worker housing, to upgrade ag equipment, and to install DCFC level three chargers. With an eye to equity coupled with an awareness that many of these enhancements are out of reach for our underserved communities, we provide an additional $1,000 Electrify Your Ride and Electrify Your Home rebates for income qualified customers. In partnership with the state, 3CE has garnered over $589,000 for your community. Please see the rebates and incentives page on our website for more information and to apply. With the continued support of the City of Santa Maria staff, council, and community, along with the rest of our communities, 3CE will continue to deliver the innovative solutions, impactful programs, and exemplary service, along with clean and renewable energy. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Thank you. Any questions from the council? Oh, Ms. Soto. Thank you. Um, you mentioned 100% clean renewable energy by 2030. Um, how is that coming along? We are on track. We're actually ahead of, uh, of the pace. Um, we're at, going to be at 60% by uh, 2025 uh, and on track to be at 100% by 2030. And Mr. Mr. Escobedo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I have a question here about the uh, electrify your right. Uh, that's uh, the focus on residential uh, based people, like regular people that can request this uh, uh, incentive to acquire. Is it just for electrical vehicle or also hybrid or the plug-in? I don't know if I missed that more. That's a great question. Um, so you're asking if hybrids are covered under the Electrify Your Ride program and whether or not that applies to community members rather than agencies or business. Um, I believe, and I apologize for not knowing the answer straight out, I believe it's EV only. However, it can be new, uh, new or uh, purchase or lease vehicles. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, aimed at residential customers, not the business community. Uh, we have a different program for member agencies. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I just want to clarify. Ms. Hernandez. Yeah. Um, for residential customers, the reimbursement to electrify your car is $5,000? That's correct. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have any requests to speak or written correspondence? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, not on this item. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? Okay. I want to thank you very much for coming down here and thank you for all the information. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to sit on your council meeting tonight and all of the proclamations and the pre previous presentation. It was a delight to be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It, <laughs> you can stay for the rest of the meeting. Um, any questions, Mr. Silla, or comments? Okay. Moving on to the consent calendar, Madam Clerk, could you please read the description? 
Routine items are presented for city council approval without discussion as a single agenda item in order to expedite the meeting. The consent calendar is approved by roll call vote with one motion. These items are discussed only on the request of council members. Does anyone have items they wish to pull for discussion? No. No? Okay. Do I have a motion? I move that we approve the consent calendar. Second. I'll second. I have three seconds. I have a motion in three seconds to approve the consent calendar. I'll take the first one I heard. Okay. <laughs> All right. Roll call. Roll, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Roll call. Uh, Council Member uh, Herna Aguilar Hernandez. Aye. Council Member Soto. Aye. Council Member Escobedo. Aye. Council Member Cordero. Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino. Aye. Okay, next we have a regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider its allocations totaling 37,500 to public service services programs under the Community Development Block Grant funding and receive information on American Rescue Plan Act funding for organizations that provide overnight shelter to homeless. homeless. Staff report is to be made by Community Programs Manager, Ms. Rojo. Um, okay. Council Member Escobedo has his hand up first. Oh, Mr. Recuse, I'm sorry. <laughs> hand up there? Yeah, I see it. Uh, oh, because, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes. Yeah, just uh, due to a potential conflict of interest, I need to recruit myself from this item, even though that I would love to be. It's a, and I appreciated the hard work that uh, that the commissioners and the staff put to put this together. So I'm going to be uh, muting myself and also turn it off the video. Thank you very much. So staff report to me made by Community Programs Manager, Ms. Rojo. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. We come before you tonight to accomplish two things. To have City Council allocate its 37,500 in community development block grant funding to a couple of public service programs initially not recommended for funding by the Block Grants Advisory Committee and as directed at the previous City Council meeting to provide information on American Rescue Plan Act funding for the possibility of using 40,000 for organizations that provide overnight shelter to the homeless. Community development and finance staff consulted with ARPA experts regarding the potential uses for the city's funds and found the following. Under ARPA, the addition of a new project would result in a significant increase in administrative duties for both city and potential agency recipients. According to the city's ARPA consultants, at a minimum, the city would need to publish a notice of funding availability which defines the amount of funds available, the desired scope of work, the application process, and the fiscal and administrative requirements. Since ARPA funds are tied to the COVID-19 pandemic, the financial and or administrative impact of the pandemic may also need to be shown by applicants to justify the need for these funds. The city cannot provide ARPA funds to a select agency or agencies without first allowing others to apply. This public participation process may take at least 30 days to complete, maybe longer depending on staff and additional ARPA, ARPA requirements. Based on staff's analysis, it is recommended that ARPA funds not be used for any agency and act only on the 37,500 in CDBG funds. Should the City Council want to proceed with using ARPA funds, staff will move forward with that direction. However, the 37,500 in CDBG funds must be allocated tonight in order to meet the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's required deadline to submit the City's annual CDBG action plan. Failure to allocate the CDBG funds tonight will result in potential delays to our CDBG funds for the upcoming fiscal year. The allocations adopted by the City Council at the last meeting are included in the packet and on the screen, which I believe we had. Um, staff recommends the City Council allocate 37,500 to City Council selected agencies so that no one agency receives more than $20,924, nor less than 15,000, and adopt the total public services allocation. This concludes my presentation. I am happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions from the council? No. 
I have a question for Mr. Mr. Stilwell. Mr. Cordero? <clears throat> Mr. Stilwell, oh. with, uh, with uh, this the way it is right now, we will have each council person here will have more than 7,500, correct? Um, yes. With four of you, you would have uh, 9,375. And if you recall from what Ms. Rojo said and what the staff report says, the minimum funding is 15,000 and the maximum funding is 20,924. So if two council members do their full allocation, that would be 18,750 right in the middle of the, of the range. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any correspondence? A request to speak? We have one request to speak, speak excuse me. Okay. <laughs> we have one request to speak in the building. Okay. And we do have um, one written communication from Emily Renault, um, Development Manager for Boys and Girls Clubs, requesting consideration for funding. Okay. And Mr. Weaver. Madam Mayor and City Council, thank you for your time. Um, again, I know this is a very difficult situation. Uh, I want to thank the CDBG uh, Council. Uh, and that process is a very difficult one as they try to na navigate this. And now you have to navigate uh, what to do with these uh, allocations. Um, I'm here to say uh, again that I believe that the allocations should be made toward Good Samaritan Shelter for both of their programs, the warming shelter and for um, their shelter itself. And it's the only program in town that reaches all community members in need who are unhoused. Uh, we saw the desperate need for that this year during our winter with the rains that we've had. They, they worked very hard with your city, uh, uh, Parks and Rec, and other people to use their facilities. They worked with churches and, and even had to ask Hancock College to supply a place for a day shelter. They're very nimble. Um, and they're very effective in their outreach and had record numbers this year. Um, and so the warming center is so vital to keep people alive. I think without them, we would have had people who um, would have died this year. And then as far as the shelter, the same thing. It's the only um, shelter for all homeless people in our community. Uh, we use it at Fighting Back all the time. Uh, I met a man today who was living there uh, who had no other place to stay. Um, and he came by for some services with our agency. Um, they're so effective and, and so um, uh, frugal with their money. I think uh, it's a great organization to support, and it fits inside of what HUD uh, really thinks this money uh, should be used for, and I would ask that you would consider them for this funding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Okay. So we each have 9,375. Can I go? Oh, Ms. Hernandez? Yeah, I would like to um, ask, because I expressed an interest at the last meeting to go with the Freedom Warming Shelter Center just because it is so vital for our community to give someone a warm meal. So I would like to ask uh, Council Member Cordero if he would like to join in that. Well, yes. Absolutely. And I don't have to say all that stuff you just said. Yes. <laughs> so that would be fine. Okay. Okay, that leaves what leaves us. Um, I, I, in seeing, I think the map tonight was really, really good. I don't think we've ever seen that before. You know, I've been out on the uh, point in time count, but I've never seen the map before. I thought that was very, very interesting. So I would be really uh, wanting to go with the homeless shelter programs also, but I don't I know. I agree with you. Wait, I'll okay. join you, Madam Mayor. Okay. Mr. Weaver, you were very persuasive. <laughs> you, you know, my, may I? Yes, Mr. Cordero. Uh, I, I think it's, it's rather unusual to have one nonprofit support another nonprofit and say, hey, don't give that money over here, give it to this person. And I think that certainly shows professionalism and, and I commend you for, for uh, speaking forward and, 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 uh, and talking about Sylvia and her group. Thank you very, very much. But now we know why you stayed for the whole meeting too, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> uh, please approach the podium and also uh, fill out a slip and you can turn it in afterwards. So uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and City Council members. Uh, I'm the quiet one over here. Uh, I'm the CFO for the Good Samaritan Shelter. Uh, really appreciate the support that uh, the City Council and the City of Santa Maria is uh, providing to Good Samaritan Shelter and, and for all the years that you've been supporting us. Um, you know, uh, our shelters, our co shelter costs have increased significantly over the couple of years, you know, during the pandemic. we. Um, we were lucky enough to have funding to uh, keep up with the costs, and it just seems like every every year our budget just keeps increasing by hundreds hundreds of thousands of dollars, and somehow we manage to uh, to stay afloat. You know, piecemealing all these funding sources to continue to provide the services. Um, we provide so many services that I mean, sometimes I don't even know how we we make it, but we we are very successful. Um, we have housing uh, navigation services, we have homeless shelter services, we have residential treatment services. So we do provide a lot of services for the community and um, you know, having this funding come to us will continue to, for us to pr provide the services for, to the community. So I really appreciate that. And I, I didn't, you need to give your name because you didn't do that at the beginning, did you? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, this is Good, uh, Hector from Good Samaritan Shelter. Okay, and then I'll have you fill out a, a little slip and you can give it to our... Okay. Our, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have a speaker online. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yes. It's Kristen, Kristen Calhoun. Calhoun, yeah. A Calhoun, I'm sorry. Hi, good evening. Good I'm sorry evening. if I didn't Good evening, that. Kristen. Good evening. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm in San Diego for a conference. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much and how humbled I am at the care you guys have really taken in this process. You could have made your allocations at the last meeting, and I so appreciate that you put this through to today and took care to really think about um, your allocations and to support the work that we do at Good Samaritan. We really appreciate it. Our impact on this community is huge. We're extremely excited to be a part of this community and to be working with the homeless um, that are all of our neighbors. So I just wanted to say thank you. And um, I wish I was there in person, but I really appreciate all your care in this process. Thank you very much. Okay, I need a motion and a second on this. So moved, Madam Mayor. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve the Freedom Warming Center and, yes. the, and the Homeless the Shelter good, Program. The good, good Samaritan Shelter Homeless right. Shelter Program right. and the Freedom Warming Center. Good Samaritan, good Samaritan Shelter Freedom Warming Center. Okay. Okay, Council Member Cordero. Aye. Council Member Aguilar Hernandez. Aye. Council Member Soto. Aye. Madam Mayor Patino. Aye. Next, to where we have a regular business item. Madam Clerk, can you please read the title? Can we bring him back? Oh, it's bring right. him back. I keep forgetting about him up there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may, you may bring him back. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rojo. Council Member uh, Escobedo, are you watching on a, a live feed I'll that you can you. see that we're back on? following the rules. Mm -hmm. He's still there. He's just should I go ahead and wait for a moment? We probably should have moved this this up on the agenda and then then he could have tuned out. Oh well. Sorry. We're texting him. Okay. Do you want to just wait a moment or? Well wait yeah wait one moment until he gets back. He on. should be back if he's sitting there with his phone. Oh well, guess he's not. I tried. There he is. There he is. There he is. Thank you for rejoining us. So the next business item, Madam Clerk.
The City Council will consider technical amendments that will amend various sections and add a new chapter to the Santa Maria Municipal Code. The staff report will be made by Senior Assistant City Attorney, Mr. Patrick. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, the item before you tonight is the technical amendments for 2023. This is an annual thing that we bring to do clean up to different provisions of the municipal code that throughout the course of the year we've noticed need changes or different laws have been passed so we need to update them. It allows us to do it all at once uh, rather than uh, piecemeal. Uh, the proposed ordinance section one amends section 10-2.04 of the municipal code concerning park rules and obstructions of ways and paths to allow the city to designate certain pathways for vehicular use only. Uh, Reckon Parks requested this change because there are certain roadways through the city parks that we need to keep clear for city uh, ranger use or different maintenance use. Um, so they would be uh, posted as for uh, vehicular use only. So pedestrians would have to stay off those roads. Uh, section two of the ordinance amends section 10-2.5 of chapter two of the municipal code concerning uh, park rules and on sound amplifying systems. Uh, it clarifies the definition of sound amplifying systems to include musical instruments, speakers, and drums. So this provision doesn't necessarily change uh, what is uh, allowed within the parks. It just clarifies the definition of sound amplifying system. Uh, Reckon Parks has been getting a lot of complaints about loud music being played in the park, uh, both from speakers and uh, different musical instruments. So uh, this adds that in there. Um, they still can use musical instruments, but they have to uh, get that cleared with Reckon Parks first. Section three of the ordinance through section 11 of the ordinance uh, deals with changes to our appeals process. Um, so as it currently stands, generally a director will make a decision on, an, uh, on a different item as, as part of the municipal code. The appeals process then goes to city council. Uh, what we find is that sometimes very cumbersome. Uh, there's fees involved with that, times. It takes a long time to get a lot of these appeals uh, completed. So the change for sections three to 11 is that instead of going to the city council, these appeals will then go to the city manager. Uh, the goal here is to create a more efficient and cheaper process for people that do want to file these appeals. And most of these are very, very rarely used. You probably have not seen any of them, uh, at least any time frequently or recently. Section 12 of the uh, proposed ordinance adds a new chapter, and this involves the procedures for filing electronic statements of economic interest, interest and campaign finance disclosure statements. Uh, so that will be a new requirement based on this chapter, and the new section provides the different procedures and uh, rules for how that will be done. So the recommendation for tonight is to introduce this for first reading, and with that, if you have any questions. Are there any questions of Mr. Patrick? Let me, I, I do have a question. Is this going to be also on the, no, the noise, the a, uh, amplifying systems in the concerts in the park also? Uh, this will apply throughout the parks. Okay, so it'll also include that, because we do get complaints on that, on the music. Alex, can you help me out? Is that through a permit process? Yes, permit process. We issue a permit. Okay, so we will intro, we'll introduce a permit. They will have to apply for a permit for that process, so this wouldn't necessarily apply to it because they would be permitted. Okay, and how many decibels is that going to be? Is there a certain amount of decibels we're talking about or? This doesn't, as it's written now, it doesn't limit to a decibel. It's very difficult to enforce decibel meter hearings. You have to have a, you have to have equipment that is um, certified. You have to have someone who can operate it. It has to be kept up, those certifications. So as it currently reads, and this is how it is currently in our, our ordinance anyways, uh, Sound amplifying tools are banned unless you have the approval of rec recreation and parks. Okay. So this just this will continue. They'll just be banned. Thank you. Any questions? Hearing none. Madam Clerk, do we have any requests to speak? Or
Okay. okay. No. No. no written correspondence? No. Okay. I'll bring this item back to the council. Any further discussion? I need a motion. I move that we accept the ordinance to April 23 technical amendments. Second. I have a motion and a second to introduce the ordinance making technical amendments to the Santa Maria Municipal Code. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Um, I see that council oh. member um, has his hand up. Yes, is there a discussion? Yeah. Mr. Escobedo? Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, question about the, uh, so, so if I hit it, if I get it right, the, uh, in regards to the, the noise regulation at the park, so uh, you, when you say that it's banded, you're talking about uh, like speakers and all the display, or you're talking also about um, maybe some uh, a group that it's practicing to you know to perform. What does that entail? Uh, currently, our ordinance bans both of those practices. So the first sentence is: No person, group, or persons or organizations shall operate any sound amplifying system within the park. And then it goes on without the approval of Rec and Parks. Uh, what this change does is uh, clarifies that sound amplifying system includes, but isn't limited to, portable speakers, amplifiers, drums, and other musical instruments. So as of today, you can play your, you can practice your drum at a park. Is that correct? As of today, it, it says sound amplifying systems, and we would include drums in that. Um, this amendment is just making it more clear so that we have it specifically stated to be to explain what a sound amplifying system is, just to make it more clear when we are trying to enforce it. Yeah, because uh, that that part, it's just, uh, I do understand about sound amplifying systems and having the speakers and people, uh, you know, having a whole concert up there without any proper permission. But at the same time, uh, there's some bands and groups that are starting or kids that play in, in small groups that are starting and they do not have a, a place at home where they can practice. So they use, uh, I've seen they use uh, parks to, to do that. So uh, I'm a little bit concerned on, on how that can affect uh, those uh, musicians and uh, future musicians. So just want to uh, share that uh, that concern about uh, specifically about uh, I understand and I agree on <clears throat> band uh, putting these big speakers, but for a small band or, or a small group, I don't know if uh, regulation uh, or a band would, uh, would get uh, would be an appropriate step. Okay. May I? Yeah, 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 Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Sir, this doesn't prevent that from happening. It just says that if you're going to do it, you need to get the permit, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I have a motion. We have a motion and a second. Uh -huh. yes. yes. Okay. Madam Clerk, okay. please call the roll. Uh, Councilmember Aguilar Hernandez. Aye. Councilmember Soto. Aye. Councilmember Escobedo. No. Council Member Cordero? Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Okay. The next item is a report th from the city manager, Mr. Stilwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, next meeting of the city council is May 2nd. We plan to bring forward a retirement resolution for retiring Sergeant 2, Jesus Valle. And we also plan to bring forward a plan to consolidate the breeze and the new Kuyama transit routes and uh, bring forward an award bid for the improvements at Veterans Memorial Park and an update of and funding for Japanese Community Center at the Smith Enos area. And that concludes my report. Thank you. So let's go with the oral reports of council members beginning with, should we start with you, Mr. Cordero? Yes, Madam Mayor, thank you very much. On uh, 
April the 5th, I attended the Strawberry uh, Industry Recognition at the fairgrounds. Uh, it was uh, very well attended. On the 7th, I attended the Elected Leaders Forum uh, by Zoom on uh, uh, fighting the homeless. And on the 8th, I attended the uh, Elks Queen kickoff dinner at the San Maria Elks 1538. And I would like to comment that we've been kind of on a, on a downside of that. And this year, we have six queen candidates uh, in, in the community for uh, running for the Elks Queen. So there that was, would be it for me. There was about 700 people showing up for the dinner. Yeah, right? that was that just was... amazing. That was one of the largest dinners I've ever, the only one I think that would match for that for me was Frank Salazar's retirement dinner. Thank you. Ms. Hernandez? Yes. Um, I did the Ben Hay Show. I also attended the Strawberry Industry Recognition Dinner. On the 7th, I went attended the Zoom Elected Leaders Forum. On the 8th, I went to the Elks Queen Kickoff Dinner. And this past weekend, on the 15th, I went to the Kite Festival, which was a lot of fun. That's it. Ms. Soda? No reportable items, Madam Mayor. Thank you. April 4th, I did the ribbon cutting at the Montecito Bank and Trust, and I, you were there, Mr. Cordero. On the 5th, the Strawberry Industry Recognition Dinner. I think the highlight was, it was a program of about a half an hour. Uh, Mr. Chavez was recognized as a strawberry grower, and he had a very nice presentation to give, and so it all was about a half an hour in program, which everyone loved because everyone was busy talking. On the 6th of April, I did the Mayor's Teen Council and the LAFCO meeting. On the 7th, I did the Partners Board meeting and the Elected Leaders Forum to address homelessness. Uh, the 8th was the Elks Rodeo Queen kickoff, and April 13th was a policy team meeting, and the 17th was California Alliance of Local Electeds meetings. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, yes. Don't forget Council Member Escobedo. Yes, Council Member Escobedo. Hello, uh, okay. thank you, Mayor. On the <laughs> bed, I attend the annual strawberry industry recognition dinner. On the 8th, I attend the uh, the Queen Kickoff event. Looking forward for this year's rodeo. It started really, really well. So, and uh, yeah, and that's that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. So next next uh, meeting, you'll be sitting here at the dais, and I won't I won't forget you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes tonight's council meeting.